Welcome back to the catch up episode two. Once again, joined by my co-host, the guru, the guy who knows everything about the best game in the world. Yeah, that's what he keeps <laughs> telling you anyway. Still waiting to get a bet this year, but we'll get one very soon. The catch up week two. How bloody good. I am so excited, Kat. I thought that last week's episode, the response was unreal. People love the sort of social media side of things, a little bit different mm. uh, to what everyone else is doing. And uh, we obviously got bit of advice from people which we've taken on board, which I think was really good advice uh, to include all the pictures and the images in the actual show, which uh, Kat's been working hard in the lab and she's added all that in. I am super excited, Kat. Yeah, no, we got your feedback and I totally agree. This stuff is so much better if you can see it at the same time as us. So with that said, let's jump into the first story. This is something, I mean, I don't even think we need overlay for this one because you were living under an absolute rock if you did not see Xavier Coates try over the weekend. Even people in America saw it. It went global. It's it's a viral clip at this point. But Guru, just off the bat, like let's talk about Xavier floats. What a moment. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was pretty special, wasn't it? I um. You know, I, I followed, I was on the uh, About Even Instagram page, you know, following this whole thing live and um, I obviously took the Warriors in that game and I thought they were home and then when that happened, I've, I've just never seen anything like it, Kat. It was mm. it was incredible. And, you know, like there's been a lot of talk about it being like the greatest try that we've seen and, um, you know, I think like for the moment and just for the acrobatics that was in it, yeah. uh, it's just unbelievable. And, you know, you've got a guy like Dallin Martinez lesniak who's chasing across the field. He knows exactly what he Xavier's Coates is going to do. I mm. saw um, Willie Mason talking about it um, on levels. He summed it up really well. He Like, Dallin knew what was going to happen, but how do you stop that? And you, you can't. Like, you expect these guys to dive in there. That's all good and well. But, like, he, he jumped so high in the air, Xavier Coates. Mm. It was just phenomenal. And, like, obviously guys are practicing this, practicing this and whatnot all the time. And I'll tell you what, it's another great point. And I know it didn't actually matter in this play, but about 10 or 15 years ago, Kat, they made the real change in rugby league to make because the corner post used to be out. Yeah. They've changed that and uh, it has just changed the game. And, you know, I, I'm sure that in the next year or two, maybe in the next few months, uh, you know, because he's such a good footballer, Alex Johnson's going to break the record of Ken Irvine. Mm. Uh, he was also, you know, an, another great winger in our game. And um, just keep in mind that when Ken Irvine scored his 218 tries, the corner post was out, <laughs> which just makes his record – even more incredible. So uh, j- j- just another little angle to to, to ha- have a look at all this from. But, mate, Xavier Coates, I, I, I remember probably almost 15 years ago now, Kat, Brett Morris scored a try like this one mm-hmm. night and we'd just never seen someone put the ball down while their entire body was out. Now it happens every single – it happens in New South Wales Cup every single week. But this one, it might be the greatest one we've ever seen. Is it crazy to say that we may have had the try of the year or try of the decade in round two of 2024? It's pretty crazy. But what I do love, and this is from a Fox article, that it went viral in a Reddit sport forum that has 21 million members and a lot of them are NFL fans. You know, they're from the States and they could not believe the athleticism of of what they had seen. Some, you know, it's the internet. Some are always saying that he could have done better, but that's just ridiculous. It was an unbelievable try. And, yeah, I, I think I'm glad to see that it, it kind of stopped everyone in their tracks for that moment because it, it, it deserved that. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, like this is uh, like I think a lot of the physicality stuff and stuff that we see in rugby league, you probably don't see that as much in the – or like you see it in the NFL, but when you take away the pads and the helmets and all that, it blows Mm. them away. I think for this to get as much attention in America as it has, when you consider like – like, and, you know, I'm sure you've all seen the NFL highlights, but like every year or so there's a guy that catches in the NFL and he front flips over a defender or something like that and it gets a heap of attention like – so like that, that they actually have stuff like this in they their do. game, uh, but to get the ball grounded when you're that high in the air and you're that far over the sideline, like literally the only thing that is in the field is just his elbow to the football. It <laughs> it's is crazy. It's unbelievable, and also to oh, I, I think that like the, the the biggest thing with these tries is that these guys, how on earth they don't think to put their other hand down just mm. to stop themselves from falling. Just the courage it takes because that's a bit like all these dives are all good and well but, you know, whenever you do a dive like this, you've got to be considering how you're coming down yeah. and that's where the whole gymnastics thing that they're all doing, they're all practicing this sort of stuff and a big part of it is making sure you don't get injured after doing it and it's yeah. amazing 
that so many of these guys are jumping in the air like this at top pace. They're having other humans smack them while they're in the air, spinning them out of out of whack. And not only are they getting the ball down, but seemingly not many of them are getting injured. Hardly any of them are getting injured realistically. The more yeah. you think about it, the crazier it is. No, I know. And uh, you do see some of the teams in the – I saw in the preseason they were kind of practising tries like this with foam mats and like you were saying, kind of practising yep. the put down but then what to do with the rest of your body as you hit the ground. Uh, but – I think what's even cooler about this before we move on is when it was scored yeah. because there's the try itself and then there's this ultimate clutch moment and thinking maybe that's what led to the acrobatics because mm. it's kind of like a, a desperation move, like I've got to get this any way that I possibly can and that's what created such an unbelievable try. But I am a big fan of a clutch moment. Like I, I absolutely love them. And when you see something like that happening right before the final whistle, I mean, come on. Oh, it, it, it's going to be very, very hard to beat. And this is, you know what, Kat, this is another argument for me. I like golden point, but, mm. my God, golden try. When you get oh, stuff yeah. like this. Unreal. Thanks for coming. I, I, I've said it for a long time. I would have golden try over golden point. Every day of the week. I, I would like to see them maybe do like if it goes to extra time, both teams get one point and maybe the team that win, wins Golden Try gets the second point. I think that would be a real – and I think it would make it really interesting on the ladder because teams that go 85 minutes and get nothing to show mm. from it is very tough. But this is – I mean, it, yeah, I, I just think the whole objective of our game is to score tries and then we get to the most important moments – and all of a sudden it's about kicking a field goal, which is just asking for trouble with penalties, yeah. obstructions, all that sort of stuff. I reckon this is a classic example of what like what golden try could look like. Mm. If that was a field goal, does it get as much anywhere Definitely near as much not. attention? No, no, because we've had field goals that have that have happened in the same kind of time period in a in a highly important clutch moment, but you don't see that level of athleticism. Like even, you know, DC in his best moments, like I don't think it looks as impressive as this, which you know, I love DCE, but Coates did something amazing here. Yeah. And then um, now we added in here, I kid you not, the run sheet literally has bed shit <laughs> on about even Instagram story. And that's because Guru said, make sure you ask me about my bed shit. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, tough carry. <laughs> Really, really tough evening. Uh, I came, as I said, obviously on about even with Hello Sport now um, and I've come in on Saturday night into the studio here because I obviously I was going to Redcliffe on Sunday. We'll talk about that soon. So I had to get all the rapid review done Saturday night after the games. So I thought, you know what, I'll watch them here at the studio. I'll do a bit of content. Um, jumped on about even. I tipped the Warriors for an upset. Wade Egan then got ruled out. Got me a little bit nervous, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to back the boys in. Um, and honestly, Kat, I reckon it's one of my great masterpieces <laughs> Of all time. Um, and the thing with content, Kat, mm. if the Warriors win that, cool. The Warriors lost on the last play of the game in the most unbelievable circumstances and, my God, that makes for good content. It does. Um, if you're a fan of seeing me devastated and beside myself, it would have been great for you guys. You would have absolutely loved it. Uh, I was, I had footy cards out. I was summoning the defensive work and the <laughs> truck nutter of Todd Lowry. I had 2013 Sean Johnson cards out. I had Jerome Rapati, the 2014 Academic Team of the Year, trying to summon a bit of smart footy and it was working for a long period of time. Um, the Warriors got up. I thought I was home. A little bit of an early crow, which I've got to wear. <laughs> and then it, me just – my live reaction to watching it all just unfold. Um, honestly, I've waited like two years to watch Ryan Pappenhausen play his best footy again and I wasn't even happy for him at the time because I was devastated uh, by what was playing out. But, yeah, it, it, it was so much fun doing that sort of stuff. It was awful for me how it ended, but uh, people absolutely loved it on about even, so a really good giggle there. Yeah, well, at the end of the day, we do it for the content, don't we? So, And it's another classic example. I was talking to some boys at Redcliffe uh, yesterday who started their own podcast, Cat, mm. and they said, oh, you know, we're doing this, we're doing that, and we haven't got, you know, this has gone wrong, this has gone wrong. And I said, boys... Honestly, when you get a prediction right for content, it's not as good as when you get it completely wrong. And I always yep. use the example, 
Nico Hines last year. I tipped that he was injured. He wasn't going to play in round four of last season. He comes out and scores 180 in Supercoach. People still talk about it today. And it was – we turned it into a real positive on yeah. beers and break-evens and everything. Yeah. And that's what – you just got to lean into this stuff and make the best out of it because when things go wrong, <laughs> normally for content, it means they've gone exactly right. It's a better storyline, isn't it? It's yeah. a little bit like my decision to bench Nico Hines uh, this week in Supercoach. But we'll save that for Wednesday, I Oh, think. boy. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm going to come off the back fence for that. I mean, yeah. you still beat me, so it's not – Let's just say me and Wayne Bennett were much the same. No one's <laughs> safe in our sides. Very good. <laughs> All right. Now, this was one that just – what a moment this was. And obviously you were at KO Stadium – for mm. the Dolphins Dragons matchup. But there was something in particular that happened in this game that, similar to Xavier Coates, it really stopped everyone in their tracks. But it stopped one person in particular, <laughs> JMK, Jeremy Marshall King. He was falconed by Ben Hunt. And we're going to watch this moment. Now, my favorite clip of this was by Hectic Fred. This guy makes the best content and his his voiceover, like his reaction to this is so funny. So Guru's going to watch it now and so are you. Yeah, so shout out to Hectic Fred. Make sure you go follow him at Hectic Fred with an underscore at the end. Obviously, JMK, a uh, little charge down in this game and uh, off the boot of Benny Hunt, none other. I Let's know. have a look at uh, how Fred handled it. He's getting HIA because he got fucking falconed, bro. Look at this shit. The Falcons so bad, they sent him for a head injury assessment, cuz. Actually knocked him out, cuz. What the fuck is... Bro, what is Ben Hunt putting on those kicks? That, that is bad. That is the biggest Falcon I've seen in a long time, bro. Oh, that would hurt. Uh, you'd be an absolute... You, you'd have a headache for a week from that. I remember, Kat, years ago, there was uh, in an Origin game, Mick Crocker. Mm. Very similar thing happened to him and it literally dropped him, like knocked him out cold. Um, when you think about like just when you're... Uh, just getting hit with a ball in general hurts. Yeah. Off the boot of Ben Hunt when he's See trying him. to kick at 60 metres from four foot away... You know the craziest thing in? He, ca he came back on later in the game and scored a try. No, I, and he a great try. He actually had a really, really good game. This is <laughs> – talk about a bounce back. <laughs> we were doing the bloke team of the week yesterday and we're going through Hooker and I, I just – I can't remember who else can be suggested. Oh, it was, it was Appy that he mm. threw up and I go – Mate, JMK almost got murdered just for half time. If he doesn't, if he doesn't get a bait in that team for scoring a try, <laughs> that he's probably never going to remember. He's got to be there. But uh, unreal, a crazy moment. Like, I, I like know. the sound at the stadium. It was like his head was a drum. You heard that? Yeah, it was. It was proper. A eh? like rough as guts. That's wild. I. Uh, obviously I grew up playing soccer and it's a regular occurrence, especially as a striker for something like this to happen because I'm so close to the goalkeeper um, so many times. I've had many a ball to the face, don't make it weird, and um, especially being a winter sport on a rainy day, my God, the pain of that. I just looked at him and I, I – I was almost knocked out for him, but the sweat flying off his face and everything, it was a, it was a full cinematic moment. I um, Just on that, I, I obviously haven't played much soccer in my time, played a little bit in PE at high school and whatnot. And Kat, to this day, I remember once being there and a ball got lobbed over and I thought I'll do a header. And I've got no idea what I'm doing when it comes to headers, but I will never forget how much that hurt. Yeah. And I just remember thinking I am never doing that again. Yeah. That sucked. How soccer players – there, there must be a real art to it, There, right? There is a real art to it and you have to hit it with the right part of your head. Oh. It's very controlled. And if you don't, it hurts. Oh, my God. I've learned the hard way uh, many a time. I've actually had no surgery because of injuries um, – to this. So anyway, let's move on because this is about JMK, not about me. Um, <laughs> I know I was telling you off air earlier that I feel like I should have been an athlete and it was just a, I never found the perfect coach for me, you know, like I just, I need my Wayne Bennett to bring out the best in me, but maybe my calling was elsewhere. Anyway, once again, not about me. Um, By the way, I love how Kat pretends like she only mentioned that today. She mentions it <laughs> every single day we're in here. It's ridiculous. I'm worse than the guy that's like, you know, I could have been pro if it wasn't for my ACL. <laughs> I Guilty. don't even I don't even have an ACL to blame. Uh, anyway, look, one thing I do want to call out in this JMK Ben Hunt moment is that Ben Hunt completely stopped 
check that that JMK was all right. Yeah. It was great sportsmanship. It might be a no-brainer that you should do something like that, but you often see things like that. That's not how it plays out. So it was really nice to see from Hunt. Yeah, he's a good fellow, Benny Hunt. I'll tell you what, I was a bit surprised when I was up there at KS Stadium. My God, he was copping it from the crowd. Really? I'm not, I'm not quite sure why. Um, mm. I, you know, he's obviously a Queenslander, so I thought he would be pretty popular up there. And maybe it was just the, the pocket of blokes I was standing next to, but – my God, they went after Benny Hunt. It was pretty wild. Yeah, I mean, I don't like hearing that. I think in general that's something that you and I are definitely on the same page with is we don't like the um, the bullying towards certain individuals but obviously once again you just see a lot of it in this sport and in all sport. Um, and I, I don't need to highlight to you yeah. what they were saying but unfortunately Ben Hunt's name <sighs> rhymes with something that we're not, not going to say on this show but uh, it's certainly got to run. Right, 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 right. Yes, I think we can all use our – put our noggins together and figure that mm. one out. Um, did we talk about your KO live show? Uh, I don't think we've touched on it yet. All it right. Was, well, um, since we're, we're talking Dolphins, so yeah. we're still at KO Stadium, you went live on KO with Bloke, Guru, Timmy, obviously, Hammy and Maddie, the water boy as well. What was that experience like? Yeah, it was unreal. It was really fun. Um, obviously, going up there uh, a little bit – Behind the scenes, I guess you could call it, Kat. But fly in, fly out. Um, I've never really done it before. My God, it's exhausting. Um, I was absolutely gassed by the end of it. Yeah. A fantastic day, though. Um, KO Stadium, if you haven't been there, which I'm sure like a, a, a lot of you haven't. Um, it was unreal. It, it's like we... Uh, I don't think we really have anything in Sydney like KO Stadium. Mm. In, in what would the, you compare it to if you had to? Honestly, uh, like imagine going into South Leagues Club, in, in, into South Juniors and walking 15 metres to get your Sunday roast and then walking another 15 metres to sit down and you're looking over the field. The first grade field. Like it was just – it was crazy. I, I, I absolutely loved it. Obviously like it's an older building and whatnot. There's a lot of history in there though. Walking down, um, you know, one of the hallways and they had, you know, all the, you know, the, the jersey and shorts of like Artie Beetson when he played for the oh, Kangaroos. Wow. Brent Tate, um, all of these just absolute legends of our game that have come through the Dolphins over the last 40, 50 years. And, like, for me being a rugby league nerd, going and having a look at, you know, all their, like, boards of coaches and, mm. you know, like some very, very famous coaches have gone through there. Like, you know, your Artie Beatson's, Anthony Griffin's been there. Uh, the Mog Dog, he had a little stint there. Like, just, just all this stuff that – as a nerd, I just absolutely love. So me, Matty the Waterboy, Hammy, Timmy, we're absolutely in our element. Um, the tab section in there might have been one of the great sports bars <laughs> I've ever seen. It was incredible. And once again, I'm sitting there, you know, having a pun on horses and whatnot, and there's a window next to me. I look out the window and there's the field. Like it is That's cool. right there. Um, we then went upstairs, went to like their, their sort of function room, which is really good, you know, big enough to get a lot of people in there, but small enough that – you know, you were all in there together. It, it was, it was, it was, it was it had like a real sort of pub feel to it, which was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned it on Bloke yesterday, Cap, but the catering, six daily end points. Oh it wow, was unbelievable. What, they, what, what was the highlight? The highlight, I'll tell you what. The highlight was a platter, mm. and they had like six or seven of these with seventy lamb cutlets on them. A platter of la- of crumbed. Lamb cutlets. Oh, so there's a big budget there. Huge budget. It was incredible. Me and Hammy are walking around the stadium, like uh, I said it on Bloke yesterday, like Fred Flintstone with two bones in our hands, just chewing away on lamb cutlets. And wow. then to finish off, a platter of about 70, um, I was going to say ch- chicken fingers. That's not what they are. What are they called? Chicken um, wings? Not wings. Drumsticks? Uh, not drumsticks. Uh, tenders? tenders. Chicken you do tenders. like a chicken tender, don't you? Well, Tom and Eddie are a big chicken tender guys, and they've got me hooked. Got me hooked over in Vegas, but these were unreal. I, uh, yeah, the, the the catering and everything that was done at KO yesterday was fantastic. The people were unreal. Um, pretty special to be a part. Like, obviously, I, I've been a part of bloke for a while, and you sort of have these little watermark moments that you go, oh, that was really cool." Going on KO Live was definitely one of them, but just talking to the people in the crowd, like um, like one guy flew from Perth to come to that to meet us, you know, wow. that was just That's, insane. 
Are you for real? Yeah, came all the way from Perth. Uh, people came from like Wollongong. Uh, and, you know, they, because it was a special event in a special area where you got booze, you got free food and everything like that, tickets were like 250 bucks. So, like, it, not not a cheap day out. And for people to want to – and, like, the amount of people wearing the Could Be Anything merch as well was mm. just unreal. For, for me, I've never seen that many people wearing Guru uh, That's so in the nice. open in one spot. So that was yeah. – and even on the balcony looking over the games, you could see Could Be Anything shirts and anything throughout the crowd, which was pretty cool for, for me. Like I, I, obviously Kempi and Bloke, it's been like that for a few years. Uh, but to see, you know, my brand and stuff around the stadium was was really special for me. Uh, Matty Gillette and Ray Stone joined us. Shout out to Ray Stone. Might be the scariest MF on the planet. <laughs> he is not to be messed around with Ray Stone. Uh, very good fella. Um, and Matt Gillette, obviously a, a legend of our game, unreal. And um, the great Dwayne Bennett joined us as well. I saw that. He's very funny. <laughs> a bit of a giggle there. Uh, a bit of a different cat but hilarious. Um, excuse the pun, cat man do. Mm. Um, so he's going to be coming on the bloke show uh, every week now to do like a – I think he does a phone-in Q&A or something. So a bit more comedy there. But, yeah, just – just a great day. Um, every, the leagues club up there is fantastic. Um, the the field is unreal. The vibe around the stadium is sensational. It just, uh, yeah, I don't, it, it almost didn't feel like an NRL game. It almost mm. felt like a suburban game. And I mean that with the greatest respect because it has such a great community yeah. feel to it. Yeah. Um, and to think, you know, and I'll egg all over my face. 15 months ago, Kat, I'm sitting, I'm sitting here going – Who's going to go for the Dolphins? Who's going to cheer this team on? They don't have a location. People don't like their jerseys. How is this going to be successful? And now from being there, I understand why they're so successful because they just tick every box you possibly could and the yeah. community up there, it is second to none. And I Well, I did see that Dwayne Bennett was saying that, you know, the Dolphins don't have – you don't have to switch teams to support them but, you know, I think they like the idea that – when your team isn't playing the Dolphins, you're still rooting for them and that there's a sense of camaraderie, I guess, that they are the the newest club to the NRL and that we can all show a little bit of support for their growth. And, you know, there's nothing more, I was going to say in rugby league, but there's nothing more we love in this country than an underdog. Yeah. And this team, they are the biggest underdogs. Like, you know, you, you got all these teams, all these superstars. They didn't really have a marquee signing. Um, turned out, you know, Hamiso was turned out to be their marquee signing, but no one really expected him to mm. be as good as what he is. Now he's one of the most. And, mate, it, Kat, every time the ball came within three foot of that dude, the entire place wow. stood up. It was That's so cool. It was really, really special. Oh, he'd be loving it. That's awesome. Uh, now I want to move on because there was something that had you frothing at the mouth. <laughs> Which oh, is, boy. yeah, I mean, if oh. you didn't see Guru, Guru's uh, Instagram stories, this Diamond Heritage jersey that's been unveiled by the Broncos, it represents their 1994 uh, season. It is a beautiful jersey and you're a big fan of the social campaign that they've done as well. Oh, like I'm just opening up their Instagram now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There was ten posts yesterday advertising this jersey. Wow. And you know what? Some people might go, oh, that's a bit over the top. For me, the Diamond Broncos jersey with I believe the sponsor was Travel Land on the front in red, yeah. that is an iconic jersey in rugby yeah. league. That is one of the ones that I will always remember. The Broncos came in and, you know, obviously came in 88, won their comps 92, 93 with that very iconic jersey. Then they brought in the Diamond jersey over the next, what was it, 94? It's 94, yeah. 94. And also just on that, um, it'll be – They'll bring it out on Good Friday. Oh, yeah, unreal. Like some of the – and like I'm just having a look at some some of the pictures now and and, and Kat will add these in later. But just – the it's just such a unique jersey mm. and it is – it's almost un-Broncos because the Broncos mm. have always been very traditional with their jerseys and whatnot. Yeah. It's just a little bit different. Um, and you know what? If it wasn't, you know, the Langers, the Walters, the Renoffs, some of the, some of the greatest and most exciting players ever, would this jersey have been as popular? I'm not too sure. Mm. But some of the greats of all time wore this but jersey that, and they made it what it is. Yeah, and that's what makes it special. It's who wore it and what it represents. And there are so many jerseys throughout history that you look at and you're immediately reminded of certain players who had such an impact of the, on the game. And that's the beauty of bringing it back and then getting the likes of, you know, Reese Walsh, who is probably one of the most talked about players right now being kind of the face of this campaign as well 
it's it's a really good move from the Broncos and and I love seeing this kind of heritage uh, theme that's going on in the game because I think you should be celebrating the history. Yeah, and, you know, I'm just scrolling through their content now and having a look and I'll get to uh, Kat to add this in, but, like, the Broncos here, they've got Billy Walters wearing the jersey and then it's got an old-school TV next that's to it mad. literally showing highlights of Steve Renoff, Walters, the guys I just spoke about. Um, I just... And if you're a Broncos fan, like, this is so special. We saw the Warriors bring out their heritage jersey the other day, which was just top shelf. The Broncos have done it here. And and I love that they've gone over the top. I would rather teams go way over the top and overkill something than to underdo it. A hundred percent. And I don't think they've overkilled it. For me, I think they've nailed it. I've enjoyed every little bit of content. Um, I was actually talking to the Broncos content guy yesterday about it and just how excited they are and how happy they are with the process and whatnot. Um, um, it has just ticked every box you could possibly ask for. I think it's um, ASICs th- this jersey is with. They've nailed it as well. They haven't made it about them. It is, it is about the heritage mm. of the Broncos. Um, and I would just – I would love to see more teams do stuff like this and really embrace bringing back their old jerseys. I, I think it's – it, it, it's just sensational. I, we need more of this in rugby league. Yeah. The Tigers, they're bringing a jersey back at some point this year that actually goes back to the jersey they wore in 2000 when the West Tigers first came into the comp, mm. which, you know, isn't as, you know, a wildly successful jersey like this one, but it's one that stands out for me, one that I remember because the first time we ever saw the West Tigers with the Meriton sponsor across the front, it was a combination of Balmain and the Magpies for mm. the first time. I just I love clubs that do this. I saw you know we we, we went to the pub on Friday Arvo Cat to have a few beers and Maddie walked in with his John Sattler thirteen yeah, jersey I loved on that. with the half bunny the collar. That's the big standout for this Broncos jersey is the collar. That's what separates yeah. it for me. Um, I as you will you guys know I am the king rugby league nerd and I just think the Broncos have hit this for six. I absolutely loved it. Yeah, no, it's it's very nice and I couldn't agree more that more more clubs need to be doing it as well. Uh, big fan. And we also spoke last week about how, you know, the technology's changed from, you know, down to the field itself and obviously the television component and what you can see but down to what the players wear and stuff. So it's really cool to see a, a more classic design yeah. reproduced with – the up-to-date kind of fabrics and the way that the games evolve. So you can, yeah, the the crossover is really, really nice. I I love it. I'm just watching more of their content now. It is just top shelf. I love it. Speaking of the Broncos, now we have been absolutely spoiled with um, intimate moments the past couple of weeks. We had the kiss last week, the famous kiss between Mitch Moses and Bryce Cartwright. And now we've got a kiss between Latrell Mitchell and Reese Walsh. Guys, there's an image here. I don't know if you if you saw it, Guru, uh, but it was quite a moment and uh, it looked like Mitchell, I, I reckon he tackled Reese just for a little cuddle. And I back it. If you get the opportunity to kiss Reese Walsh on the neck, I think you've got to take it with two hands. Um, I was obviously on the live stream with Hello Sport for this one, so I uh, was sort of watching it and, and and sort of commentating at the same time and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, pretty cool moment. I, I thought I thought the best bit after Cat was when they both cramped at the same moment. I know. what a f- It was so funny. Like just the whole the whole 30 seconds was really entertaining. Isn't it just great in rugby league when you see things that you just you don't normally see and they just like when Joey Manu um, lost his shirt when he was playing for New Zealand, you had yeah. a player running around shirtless with these two guys both cramping on the same metre square on the field, both with their teammates around them, stretching them out like um, it was just – yeah, I, I, I remember at the time we, we were watching and just said, oh, meme kings, yeah. do your thing. Yeah, There's do something thing. special here. It's so funny. Uh, what I love too and speaking of hectic Fred again, he posted – a reaction to this moment as well which I will link in the description because his video is so so funny but um he was he was just saying that Trell was sass with Reese and then <laughs> Trell actually commented on it and did the laughing face and said that you got me um and Hectic Fred replied I can't blame you cuz Reese is just so beautiful <laughs> oh fuck 
It's yeah, and, and you know, I love when players get involved with that sort yeah, of stuff. And you know what, Latrell, he's you know he's always in the headlines and whatnot. And there's a lot of things to jump on Latrell's back for recently. But the way that he interacts with fans like that, it's so good. I love it. Yeah, no, I I, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's the lighthearted part of the game. It's being able to poke a bit of fun at yourself. And obviously, that's not what he was doing in the moment. But it, it was so funny just to to see him going along with the joke. <laughs> but while we're on Latrell. I also love that he obviously got his 100th try in that same game. Mm. Um, But Cast Patrol, who are another creator that I wanted to call out in the rugby league space, they do so much hard work. They're constantly creating content. Luttrell actually reposted their graphic uh, for his 100th try, which I just think is such a cool achievement, I suppose, for them. Oh, for sure. And, you know, the Cast Patrol boys, I've met them briefly once or twice um they're south sydney guys mm. um they live in the local area uh and for you know like it's it's such a simple and small thing but for latrell mitchell to reshare their image for a big moment in his career it's special you know and like the boys put so much effort into their content as all content creators do and whatnot and to get a little bit of recognition in those mm. moments and it can make a real difference as far as like latrell sharing that getting seen by thousands and thousands of people i'm sure they would have got a lot of followers off the back of it and whatnot but it just adds to the it don't it, like it sounds stupid cat but it, like content is in you know you'll be able to talk more about this it very is much so like when you're at high school and you mm. get accepted as, oh yeah you know cool kid or sporty kid or whatever the hell it might be to have guys like Latrell and other people sharing your content it almost sort of gives you like the tick of approval definitely in rugby league and it, it validates the the yeah, work that you're doing as stupid as that sounds and I know it sounds ridiculous that is kind of what it's like realistically yeah. but I think it would be silly not to admit that you yeah. know and I wanted to ask you if a player has ever reposted anything of yours or re- interacted with yours and you're like I've just made it. Yeah, and like there, there's been a lot of those, like especially like in the – like it's obviously becoming uh, a little bit more normal now to mm-hmm. have interaction with players and whatnot. But like I still remember where I was sitting when um, when like I, I got my first ever like from an NRL player. Like Who I was still it? remember thinking – it was Corey Allen. I remember okay, yeah. Corey Allen. Like, yeah. And Corey Allen at this point was a kid that had moved from Brisbane to play for the South Sydney Rovers. Hadn't even played first grade yet. So maybe he wasn't even an NRL player wow. at that point. But I spoke about him as a bit of a cash cow for Supercoach and he liked the image. And I just remember – and this is when I had – might have had 50 followers – and it wow. was just out of this world sort of stuff, unbelievable. I still remember um, Cody Walker followed me when I had about a 1,000 followers and I just remember thinking, oh, my God, that's unbelievable. Uh, the biggest one for me, though, was Latrell. I posted something about um, the pressure on JD or pressure on South. You know, I remember Latrell commented on it and sort of said, oh, you know, um, like something like – run your mouth now, we'll get the results in eight weeks' time when I'm back or, you know, yeah. we're, we're going to turn this all around, we, we back JD. And I remember it got picked up by the Telegraph and it was in there and everything and it just – was. and, and then there, there was another thing from Latrell as well about after a State of Origin game I posted something and it was something about how he wanted a certain jersey back and he, you know, I reshared that and I think it ended up in the paper again. So just those little moments that for content creators who work so hard – quite often for not a heap, mm. when you get those little moments, um, it can just give you so much uptick. And obviously I've been very lucky to be involved with, um, you know, like Kempi and Bloke in a Bar, which is just such a big thing mm. uh, standalone. But when you do get those players that interact with your stuff on their own, uh, uh, my God, it's special. Yeah, and I think – for you as well, going to Vegas and seeing how many players know your face and mm. recognise you and like took the time to talk to you, that stuff also validates the role that you're playing in the game. And I think, um, you know, we've talked about it and we'll continue to talk about it. I think the role of the content creator is more than just Instagram and TikTok. It's you create a lot of conversation around the game that you don't find in traditional media yeah. and fans appreciate it but players also appreciate it because, you know, we we like to in particular focus on the really wholesome and positive parts of the game. We're not here to bring anyone down or, or kind of perpetuate the negativity that you do tend to see in the media and I think over time you really do see how much a player appreciates that and that's why they'll take the, te- the time out of the day To talk to you. Yeah, for sure. And like give you a really good example, when I was in Vegas, I was at the Roosters captain's run, I'm sitting there watching it all play out and um, I saw Boyd Cordner walk off the field and he's walking in my direction. Then he came and sat down next to me and we spoke for about – 
20 minutes or so. And you know what? I look at Boyd Corner and I go, mate, you're an old school country boy. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if you've never opened social media, let alone have the slightest idea who mm. I am or what I do. And, you know, Boyd knew it all. We spoke for 20 minutes. He, he, he spoke he, he spoke to me like I'd known him for 10 or 15 years. And I just sort of – and I, and I, you know, all the journos that Boyd's known for the last 20 years of his life were all sitting there as well. And came over and sat next to me to just talk about footy, life and just whatever's yeah. going on, Vegas and whatnot, which, yeah, when you get those little moments, um, it's pretty special. And I can guarantee you he's not going up to, you know, any journo and having those same conversations. Like there's an, there's probably an element of trust as well because of the nature of your content. Yeah, and I, th- I think a big part of that is the the community and the environment that Kempi's built Yeah, that – you know, you can have media, we can report on the game, we can be honest, which sometimes means being negative on players, but there's a way to deliver it. Mm. Um, and I think that's what we have done well. And well, I know from talking to players, that's what they appreciate. Definitely. And I just wanted to add like a, a huge moment for me was like bumping into Luttrell and him recognizing me yeah. and me going like, okay. This is pretty cool. Yeah, it's cool. I, you know, you're, yeah. you're recognised. You feel like you're actually contributing something. Now, I wanted to shed some light on, speaking of wholesome moments, um, Shanice Parker, who <laughs> plays for the Knights, um, obviously in the NRLW, she ran into a Knights fan who's been a fan since, you know, the mid-80s. Um, it was someone's grandmother. And there's this gorgeous Instagram post, which I'll I'll include here um, from the NRL roast. We love Roasty's work. He's also, speaking of creators, he's also so good at highlighting these really positive moments. But I just love this. You know, speaking of kind of meeting your idols and whatever, it's so nice when you witness these moments where hardcore fans get to meet someone or a player that means a lot to them. It's just these are my favourite moments. Yeah, for sure. And like I'm sure for a lot of the NRLW girls that like this would be a pretty new experience for them. Yeah. But I think these moments just show the sort of impact that the girls are having. And you know what? Like I, I was walking down the street. I, I mentioned this the other day. I was walking down the street in Las Vegas and I'm walking down and, and I saw um, – I ran into um, uh, Chelsea Lenarduzzi and she's come on the podcast and we've spoken a little bit. But even before that when I saw her, I was like, oh, there's Chelsea, there's – the NRLW Australian front row forward, yeah. you know, like and, and and she said hello to me mm. simply because she beat me to it. Um, but I was like, oh, you know, like I, I like for, for me, you know, and the the Australian Rugby League women's team has been around for a long time. But the reality is, twenty years ago, I wouldn't have had any idea who was playing in the front row. I wouldn't have yeah. had any idea who was the captain. And it has grown so much to the point now that these girls have the profiles that, that they do. And so they should. And what an unreal moment and sort of once again going back to those sort of watermark moments, I'm sure the girls would have plenty of them. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I've got uh, um, nieces that um, live up in Queensland who, you know, they 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 are now just talking about the NRLW girls the same as I talked about the NRL boys when mm. I was their age. And it is just – it's unreal to see. It is fantastic. The NRLW – you know, we, we've got a we, we've got a lot more things that we can do a lot better with the NRLW game. I was talking to some of the girls over in Vegas that were there and sort of saying that you know they play their state of origin game before they actually start their season. Yeah, it which, doesn't make sense. It it just doesn't it doesn't make sense for, like to to send the girls into that cauldron to play some of the toughest rugby league you possibly can off no ex, off no games. Uh, it's a nightmare. It's also you know they're trying like. It's state of origin. This is what we sell our game off. It's the yeah. biggest moment of the year. The girls will be out there on Magic Ground on the Thursday night. I believe me and Kat will be yeah. there for that one. Kat yeah, will yeah, wait we'll for there. it. We'll We've there. made sure we're going up early to be there for it. Uh, but for the girls to sh- you know show the hallmark of their game without having games before, I mean, like you've seen in the first two weeks of the NRL, you know how how scrappy is some of the football. Mm. Because they, 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 they don't have the runs under their belt. They don't have the game, um, the match fitness and whatnot. So that we have got a lot more things we need to tick with the NRLW to improve it and that will happen over the next few years. But I think, Kat, when you sit back and you look back to where it was five years ago and even just the general perception of people of the NRLW yeah. five years ago, it really has come on 
leaps yep. and bounds. I think so too. And I think um, looking at the expansion of NRLW versus AFLW, for example, I think, you know, it was smart to kind of do it, not just every club at the same time, but yep. to really expand where there was the resource to do it and where there's the talent to do it. And I think that will in the long run make for a, a much higher quality game. So I think, yeah, it's good to see that there's a lot more opportunity in that space and watch her footy is a creator who does a lot yes. of NRLW content and I'd love to get her on one day and, and have a, a chat about the NRLW and where it's at. But um, definitely check out her content if you are an NRLW fan. Yeah, she, she does some f- fantastic work. I, uh, I actually had her on the podcast in the last year for the, for the NRLW um, grand final and mm. yeah, we, we'd like, I mean, there, there, there's a white space there too for, you know, and I think there, there, there's, there's a few people doing a, 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 like NRLW content, but I'll tell you what, there is a real, and I, I hope she's the one that grabs it. Me too. There's a white space there for a content creator to really own that mm-hmm. and be the main person for NRLW mm-hmm. over the next few years. So really, really exciting there. We're, we're definitely heading in the right direction. And, you know, when you think about, you know, in, in you know, the, the last 10 years or like eight years or however long it's been, how far the NRLW has come in that period of time, like just imagine where it's going to be in 20 years, especially when you consider, okay, like it took 90, 80 odd years for the men's yeah. game to even be professional. Yeah. The, the distance the girls have come in just a few years' time has been it's incredible. Yeah. It's great. And, I mean, like look at look at other sporting codes and like the Matildas versus Socceroos. Like there's no question which team's making the headlines these days and I think, um, you know, the, the conversation is where the quality is and yeah. I hope that that just continues to expand for NRLW. But speaking of females and, um, you know, just <laughs> opportunity, as you all know, I'm the Rook. Uh, in uh, beers and break evens. I'm just the rook in general. That's the name I get when I walk in the doors here every morning. Um, and that's fine. I'm okay with that. I've I've accepted my fate as the rook this year. But I need to call you out because I have a bone to pick with you, Guru, for making me sound like a violent, uh, <laughs> destructive person in the studio here. Uh, so I'm going to play this video of you on the Hello Sport live stream. Uh, mm. By the way, um, Cody and uh, my producer Cat, uh, the race for Dally M Rookie of the Year in the producer category. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's picking uh, up very quickly. You yeah, know, we is. brought it up tonight, and Cat was not happy. Oh, really? really? Yeah, she took it personally. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. Wow. I think I was complimenting what I assume and res- respect to anyone that else if they did it, but I was complimenting Cody's design of um, the nerd out. Post, right. yeah, right. saying yep. good it yep. was, and uh, was Cody. Cat almost flipped the fucking table. She oh, was not no. happy. No, well, well you like a bit of fire, though. No, you do. You like a bit of passion. <laughs> I appreciate Tom and Eddie saying that you, you know, that a little bit of fire is okay, but why are you lying like that? Oh, uh, Cat, <laughs> you never let the truth get in the way of a good story, okay? And I, uh, the, the, like the, the race for Dally M Rookie of the Year between you and Cody, I actually completely forgot. We've got to actually put uh, the great Willie Birmingham in there as yes, well, true. who's joined. So uh, I realized that after, but yeah, that three way race for Dally M Rookie of the Year is heating up. And you know what? I thought, you know what, this is a good way to get some headlines, a good way to get a bit of sp- <laughs> bit more spotlight on Katmandu. Um, never let the truth get in the way of a good story, Kat. No, you're right. And look, maybe it is true. You did hire an Arab and sometimes these things come with the territory. Yeah, I've got a bit of fire in you. Let, let, <laughs> let, let, let's not tiptoe around. Yeah, my fire is in my words, though. I don't need to flip tables. I can, uh, I can get you with my words. Yeah, well, there's about uh, five thousand dollars worth of gear sitting on that table. So if you want to flip something, find another table for me, please. Yeah, it's okay. There's there's a couple of tables over there that I can use. Um, I mean, I've almost flipped this table by accident because I'm obviously Bambi. Uh, very clumsy. We Bambi all know this. Yeah. yeah, we do usually do a guess who. So I'm actually going to throw one in because it was recommend, uh, it was sent to me as a as a comment. Um, so I'm going to quickly look it up. Now shout out to NRL Odd Stats. They sent me this little trivia guess who for you, Guru, because mm. maybe they thought I wasn't good enough at it last week. Uh, <laughs> Or they just wanted to help, which I'm going to roll with that one. Here comes another table flip. (laughs) 
<laughs> okay. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven clues. Oh, and I'm yeah. going to read them in order of what's been provided. And let's see how you go. Uh, uh, they're, they're current players, right? Correct. Yeah, good. Okay, sweet. All right. I am 28 years old. 28 years old. Okay, a couple of years younger than me. Yep. Born in Kalgoorlie. I said that so weirdly. Born in Kalgoorlie. Okay, yeah. Played under Ricky Stewart and Josh Hannay. I played under Ricky Stewart and Josh Hannay. So if he's 28 years old, it means that he had to have just played at Canberra. I don't think Ricky's coached anyone else in the last 10 years or so. Josh Hannay. Now, Josh Hannay was at the Cowboys and the Sharkies as a interim coach, I believe. Keep going. <clears throat> debut at Carrington. Made your debut at Carrington. Okay. Yeah. Try scorer in international debut versus Greece. A try scorer in international debut versus Greece. I'm going to be completely honest with you. That doesn't help me in any way, okay, shape, or form. We can move form. on to the next one. Lost last two finals appearances in the front row by two points or less. In this the is front a toughie. row. Okay, so it's a front row forward, 28 years of age, who played – for the Canberra Raiders and I think either the North Queensland Cowboys or the Cronulla Sharks. Have, have I got a debut year? 2017. 2017. I, oh, okay. You've got one more clue and I think you'll get it with this last clue. I kind of want to have a stab at it. Okay, go. Right now, but I'm not, I'm not super confident. Um, oh, see, I went early last week and I lost and that really stung me. I've got a guy in mind at the moment. I think you know who it is. I think you need to trust your gut. Okay. Is he a guy that I get reasonably excited about? Yeah. Yeah. Is it Royce Hunt? It is. Yeah, boy, Royce the choice. How <laughs> Look good. at you far out, man. Very I good. That I'm... was tough. That was very tough. Yeah. Uh, I probably wouldn't have got it without the front row forward clue. If I didn't yeah. have that, I would have been in all sorts. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, obviously played for Ricky Stewart when he made his debut in Canberra a few years ago. Then he fell off the map for a couple of years, mm -hmm. Royce the choice. Uh, and then he would have gone to Cronulla and he would have played under Josh Hannay when he was the interim coach between Johnny Morris and Craig Fitzgibbon. You've absolutely smashed it. Thank God. Okay, one apiece, Kat. I am back in the business. Who sent that one in? That is from NRL Odd Stats. That was good. So that was thank an odd you one. so much. Uh, that was tough. If you guys want to send one in, by all means, but you know, let's let's keep it a little difficult because that was really fun. <laughs> that, that that was tough. Yeah. I, I I tell you, I was panic stations until I heard front row forward. I don't know if I would have got it without that. <laughs> Nah, well, you smashed it. Well done. Well, guys, that's it. Thank you so much for joining us for the Catch Up Episode 2. We'll be back next week with all the top stories over the weekend, the top social media pieces that, you know, are heartwarming, that made us excited, all the stuff that's worth talking about. So like we said, feel free to send us anything you want us to react to. But until then, say goodbye, Guru. I've actually got to go to the little boys' room, so this is good timing. <laughs> See you next time. Bye, guys.